Hallelujah. So in this session, we're going to be looking at being a disciple. And we're going to, we're going to look at it. I want you firstly to go to Isaiah chapter 8. And we're basically going to be in Isaiah most of the time too. <laughs> in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16... I just want you to, we're just going to read this verse, but we're going to come back to it in just a bit. But just to see the word disciple here. So it says in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16, Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. So this is one of six occasions that this word for disciples appears in the Old Testament. And I just want you to get this word up here, Judith. So the word disciples is, for those of you who have the Strong's Concordance, it's, it's the Hebrew number 3928 in the Strong's Concordance. 3928. And it's the Hebrew word, limud. Say limud. <laughs> L-I-M-M-U-D. L-I-M-M-U-D. Yep. So I don't know if any of you read, have ever read the um, Jewish New Testament by that David Stern, but he always calls disciples Talmudim. And so it's got this word within that. And, and so disciples were limud. And the word limud, okay, Judith, comes from a word lamad. L-A-M-A-D. So just, you can put from lamad. And lamad means to goad. So do you know what a goad is? Yeah, it's, it's a thing that, it's like a rod that you prod a cat, you know, cattle or whatever that you're training. You see, you're training an animal and you use a goad to give it direction and instruction. Amen. So this is getting into the idea of what a disciple is. Amen. Someone who's goaded. And, and it says, Lamad, so this is that word that Limud comes from, also by implication means to teach or to learn. So just put to teach, or yeah, by implication to teach or to learn. And is very often used in the Bible of learning God's law, learning God's word. Hallelujah. And then, so this is what that word lamad, where this word limud comes from. This word means to goad, or by implication to teach or to learn. And the actual word then, limud, it means instructed or taught. Instructed or taught. So limud means instructed or taught. So you're starting to see what a disciple is. It's somebody who is being instructed and taught. Being goaded. Pricked. It's not good to kick against the goads. That's what Jesus said to Paul when he was Saul. When he was actually persecuting Christians. And he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When that light from heaven... Hit Saul. And he said, Who are you, Lord? Well, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So Jesus was almost saying, I've been trying to disciple you. Wow. I've been goading you, but you've been kicking against the goads. Who are you, Lord? I, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I'm the one who's been trying to disciple you. Whatever you tell me to do, Lord, I'll do it. He committed his life to be a disciple right then. Amen. Hallelujah. Wow. And so really when we, when we confess Jesus as our Lord, that's what we're meant to be really confessing, is that we're deciding to come into a discipleship life with him. We'll be instructed by him now. So a disciple is one who is instructed and taught. Amen. And I just want you to see 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 16, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Who knows these verses? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, equipped for every good work. So, 
one of those major things that the Word of God is for, that the Scriptures are for, is to bring instruction. Instruction for righteousness. How to walk in a right way with God. Amen? So discipleship is, is getting into the lifestyle that is the right way to live with God. It's the, the Scriptures are profitable. And that word instruction also could be translated training or discipline. So for reproof, for correction, and now the key one, instruction. Instruction in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness. And that word instruction could also be translated as training or discipline. So the word of God, the scriptures, is actually profitable to instruct, train and discipline us, discipline us in righteousness. Amen. So are you being discipled? If you are allowing the word of God to give you doctrine, reproof, correction and to instruct, train and discipline you, then you are a disciple. Hallelujah. You're being taught. You're being discipled to the word of God. And all discipleship is meant to be to the word of God. Amen. So even when you're in a place where you're starting to disciple others, you're discipling them to the word of God so that the word of God can instruct, train and discipline them. Amen. Being a disciple. So let's go back to Isaiah chapter 8. And the passage that that verse 16 appears in begins in verse 11. So I want to start in verse 11. Because this is, this Isaiah 8 passage is wonderful in picking up some really key things about being a disciple. So in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 11, this is what Isaiah the prophet says. He says, For Yahweh the Eternal One spoke thus to me with a strong hand or with mighty power. So this is a strong... Uh, the way that God speaks with Isaiah here is in a strong way. He came with a strong hand or it says it could, that could also mean with mighty power and instructed me. What did he do? He instructed Isaiah. Okay, so there's some discipleship happening. Amen. Yahweh is instructing or discipling Isaiah and this is what he says. He instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people. So the instruction, the discipleship is, is to bring us out of the way of this people and into a new way. Hallelujah. So I want you to pick up on this word way. So the, the call of discipleship is a call out of the way of this people. So just keep your finger, we're going to be going back and forth, but we're going to be staying in Isaiah 8, so keep your finger in Isaiah 8, but go to Acts chapter 2. And we're just going to read from verse 40 and 41. Because the call of discipleship is the call out of the way of this people. It's to come out so that you can learn a new way. So in Acts 2 verse 40, Peter sa it says about the day of Pentecost, and with many other words, he, Peter, testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Do not walk in the way of this people. Amen. This was, the first in this, was this instruction given to Isaiah. He instructed me, do not walk in the way of this people. Peter on the day of Pentecost, preaching Jesus Christ, calls the people out saying, do not walk in the way of this people. Be saved from this perverse generation. Amen. And in verse 41, he then says, then those who gladly received his word were baptised and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Hallelujah. So he, they were called out of the way of this people and, now in, and they were initiated into a new way by receiving the word gladly and being baptised. This was the call into discipleship, into the way. Hallelujah. Have you accepted the call? See, by believing and being baptised, we're called out of the way of this people into a new way. Many people didn't realise that. They just thought they were called out so that they could go to heaven when they die. But Peter didn't say that. He said, be saved from this perverse generation. 
In other words, do not walk in the way of this people. There's a, there's a different walk. Amen. And through baptism into the name of Jesus Christ, you're taking on Jesus Christ as your discipler. <laughs> Amen? Because you actually come under the teaching now of the one you're discipled in. You're coming under the teaching of the one you're baptised in. And so back in Acts 2.38, it says that baptism was into the name of Jesus the Messiah. So now you have a rabbi. <laughs> now you have a teacher. Now you have an instructor. You have a discipler. You have an apostle named Jesus who is now the one discipling you. Hallelujah. Through the ways that he's given. And so now you're part of a fellowship. These people became a 3,120 strong fellowship of disciples now. Now immersed into the name of Jesus Christ to learn a different way. No longer walking in the way of the people, but now walking a different way together. Being discipled by Jesus the Christ together. Who wants to be in a fellowship like that? Yep. Hallelujah. And so the church is a fellowship of disciples of Jesus Christ. The church is a fellowship of disciples of Jesus Christ. The early church were called the people of the way. Yeah. See, God said to Isaiah, do not walk in the way of this people. There's a different way. John 14, verse 6. What does that say? Everyone should know that. Jesus said, I am, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That doesn't mean he's the only... It doesn't just mean he's the only way. Many people preach that, saying it's the only way to go to heaven. Jesus is the only way to go to heaven. That's not what Jesus was talking about. He said, I am the way, my life, my lifestyle. Everything about me is the way for you to know the Father. Amen? So are you walking in the way today? It's a lifestyle. And so the early church actually became known as the people of the way. Look in Acts chapter 9 and verse 2. Acts chapter 9 and verse 2. You can read it from verse 1. It says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, against who? So it's good for us to start to get our identity as disciples. That when you wake up in the morning, you can begin to say, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I am a disciple of the Word of God. Because it didn't say that, that here, that Saul was breathing threats and murder against the believers. It was against the disciples. Believers aren't so scary. Disciples are because they're, they're living in a certain way that you won't be able to shift them because they've learnt that way from Jesus. So you can't, you can't legislate and try and make them do something different because they're walking by a different government. They're walking according to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the only true potentate. Hallelujah. And so Saul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he went to the high priest and he asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way. Isn't it awesome that the early church had this name put on them, that they were the people of the way? Hallelujah. Wouldn't it be wonderful if more and more in our day people began to know us because of the way we live? because of the lifestyle we're in. Hallelujah. That they saw that it was, there's something about the way they live, the way they function, the way they conduct themselves. They never revile, even when people revile them. There's something different about these people. But they, they don't just, they're not just walkovers, they stand very strong, but they never revile. What an amazing people these are. They're of the way. Hallelujah. So these were people of the way and, and Saul was persecuting the people of the way. Have a look in Acts chapter 19 though, verse 9. Because the very people that Paul was persecuting, he became of the way also. <laughs> and so in Acts chapter 19 and verse 8 and 9, it says... And he, Paul, went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. 
But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples. The disciples are the people of the way. Hallelujah. So in that sense, it's not just the believers that are of the way. It's the disciples who are learning the way. Amen? Who've actually committed themselves to be goaded and instructed in the way, to be prodded and poked in the way. (laughs) Hallelujah. You know, in Hosea Hosea somewhere, Hosea prayed that, 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 was it his wife or any, or the people of God would be hedged about with thorns. His wife. He prayed that she'd be hedged about with thorns. So if she moved that way, ooh, she moved, ooh, better go this way. Ooh. That's right, she was a parable of the people of God. And so we, God wants to goad us. He wants to allow yourself to be instructed, taught in the way. Because Paul, when he preached concerning the kingdom of God and was speaking boldly, there were some disciples that, that came about from that. They decided, I want to follow that way. I want to follow the way of the kingdom of God. I want to follow Jesus the King. I want to, I want to walk in his way. And so people started to speak evil of the way. And Paul withdrew the disciples and began reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. So that reasoning daily was discipleship that was going on. It was, it, was, it was actually the goading of each other with the Word of God. Do you converse a lot in the Word of God in your own home? Because if you do converse a lot in the Word of God in your own home, you'll be discipling each other. Because the Word of God will goad and, and prod. And, and even Paul says in Colossians 3 verse 16 that we are to admonish one another with psalms and speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, admonishing one another. So the admonishment of the Word of God even comes through singing a song. You know, one of your family members may wake up and they're all, you know, sad-faced and, you know, oh, you know I don't, it's not feeling good today and that, and you just start singing, Praise the name of Jesus. Suddenly that person gets a bit goaded. Oh. Yeah, okay, praise the name. And they get out of that sad face and get out of that bad mood and they start getting prodded by the word and they start getting back in the way. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Now look in verse 23 of Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 verse 23. It says, and about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. So the way can cause a great commotion. <laughs> commotion, C-O-M-M-O-T-I-O-N. And that, that was because when people, started, when people started walking in the way, people stopped worshipping idols and stopped going to the temple of Diana started walking in the way and so then the people who were involved in providing all the wares that go with the worship of Diana, they began losing money and so now we need to get these people of the way. So when the people of the way start multiplying and disciples are multiplying, then people don't go to the strip club and the strip club starts getting upset and causes a commotion about the way or whatever it might be. (laughs) <laughs> so they go to the council. But then because the council has got so many people involved in it that are in the way, they stand against it. <laughs> Speaking out the things that are not as though they were. Acts chapter 22 verse 4. See, God wants us to get into this way and he wants us to pray that more and more the number of disciples will multiply. Amen. And Acts 22 and verse 4, Saul, when he's Paul, is giving his testimony and he said, I persecuted the way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. So in his testimony he said, I persecuted the way. The way will be persecuted. The way of discipleship to Jesus Christ is a place of persecution. 
may come in and, and even some people will want to persecute it to death. And so that persecution can come from family, it can come from other relatives, it can come from friends, it can come from the society at large. But if you want to follow in the way, then Jesus was persecuted and if he is our master and we're his disciples, then we should also expect that if they persecuted him, they'll persecute us. In Acts 24 and verse 14, Isn't this awesome? So we're called out of the way of this people into the way. And, this, and, and I wanted you to see as well that the church as a corporate entity were called the people of the way. How much are, you know, do you want that, that identity on, on us, not just on you individually, but on us? You know, as a people who are following Jesus, that we become known as people of that way. And in Acts 24, 14, Paul says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers. So in this way, this is the way of worship. See, Paul said, according to the way, that's how I worship the God of my fathers. So Jesus has given us, and and this way of discipleship is the true way to worship the God of our fathers. And then he said, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So if we are truly following the way, we're truly following what the law and the prophets were speaking about. Hallelujah. We're following the word of God. Amen. It says a few verses about the way. Amen. So are you a person of the way? Thank you, Jesus. So we're called out of the way of this people and into the way, which is a lifestyle. So like I said Peter, he preached, be saved from this perverse generation. They were, those who gladly received the word were being baptised. 3,000 souls were added. How did the way function? Acts 2.42. How did this way function? Well, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. This is the way. The people of the way functioned in a certain way as a fellowship together and it was in the apostles doctrine it was actually in the fellowship together it was in the breaking of bread and it was in prayers Amen so if we give ourselves into these things devotedly from the heart we'll start to be people of the way Amen and so this is the call of discipleship It's a call out of the way of the people and it's a call into transformation by that lifestyle. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 12 now. So Isaiah, God instructed him, do not walk in the way of this people. And he said to him in verse 12, do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. So the way of this people, God's people, they're not into conspiracy theories. It's Isaiah 8, verse 12, by the way. You've been still thinking you're in Paul's message. (laughs) So Isaiah 8, verse 12 says to Isaiah, do not walk in the way of this people, saying, do not say a conspiracy. So the way of this people was talking about conspiracies. You know, that there's, you know, I've met a few people already in my Christian walk who are into all sorts of conspiracies. You know, about the government. I would even say that in this aspect of conspiracies, it's even going into the depths of Satan and trying to figure out how Satan works and how, he, how he's in control of all this and all that and, and how we can... Yeah, try to get out of that, but really it's, it's not going to work. You know, he's really got control over everything. And you talk to them and it's negative, negative, negative. So do not say a conspiracy about what all the, all the others say is a conspiracy. Some of the conspiracy theories can be all about the one world government, antichrist. All that sort of teaching and doctrine is like conspiracies. Most of what people preach and teach about it is like conspiracies. 
And so do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy. Don't get involved in that. Amen? If you're a disciple, if you're somebody who's in the way, don't get into that area. Amen? And don't be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. You know, if you don't believe, yeah, if you don't believe in the one world government rapture teachings of some, they'll threaten you. You're a heretic. You're this, you're that. Don't be afraid of their threats. Amen? Nor be troubled by them. Hallelujah. So let's look at the disciples' response to threats. Look in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 14 to 16. He actually quotes this verse. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 14 to 16. Oh no, it's not. I must have put it, written it down wrong. It's chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 to 16. He says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And then he quotes Isaiah 8 verse 12 and says, and do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. But what are we to do? Sanctify, you could read it with me, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defence to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Hallelujah. So don't be afraid of threats and troubles. In the early church, when they were threatened by the Sanhedrin, when they were threatened by the, the religious leaders, they immediately went into a house together as disciples and prayed. And they said, Lord, look upon their threats. Amen and stretch forth your hand to heal and to do mighty signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. That's Acts 4 verse 29. So we, we need to see that because we're coming out of the way of this people, and that means even out of the way in the context of this people in Isaiah, that was the people of God. It was the, the Israelites, the Jews of his day that were not following God. And so there's a call out even today in the whole Christian world, there's a call out of what we've called church to become real disciples, to become people who truly follow Jesus. And when that happens, there can be threats and there can be trouble. And people may threaten, oh, what, you're going down a wrong track there. And they might try to intimidate in some way. And so we need to realise, what are we to do? We're to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. We're to set him apart. Amen? So true disciples are setting apart the Lord God in their heart. Hallelujah. That I'm just following him. I'm going after him. I'm seeking him. And then always be ready to give a defence to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so that's part of discipleship. The more you're discipled to the word of God, the more of a defence you will have, amen, to make of the hope that is in you you'll be able to base that hope on the word of God and give a good answer. Hallelujah. And those who revile your good conduct in Christ will be ashamed. So as disciples, we're learning to have good conduct in Christ so that when there is trouble and threats, those who do that will end up being ashamed because of our good conduct in Christ. Amen. So you called out as a disciple? Amen. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 13. It says, Yahweh of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. What's the intimidation of people threatening and troubling you? It's to try and make you obey men rather than God. It's to try and make you fear man rather than fear God. What's the answer to that? Hallow Yahweh. Hallow the name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallelujah. So true disciples are learning how to hallow the name, hallowing him, venerating him, revering him. Hallelujah. Hallowing the name. Learning the name. Yahweh of hosts, him you shall hallow. Hallelujah. 
And so I did you know, a message, was it last Sunday? About hallowing the name. Amen? And so we need to learn as disciples how to hallow the name. Get to know the name. In all of the context that God has revealed himself, get to know his name and hallow him. Oh, but they're threatening me. Well, Yahweh Nissi. I hallow his name. He's my banner of victory. Amen. I come to him and I bring every threat to you, Yahweh Nissi, and you can deal with the problem. Amen. Then he says, let him be your fear and let him be your dread. So God, to a disciple, God is the one that we fear more than anything else. And in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says this in sending out the apostles. So these guys were already disciples and now they were trained to start going out in some ministry. And in Acts chapter 10, oh, Matthew chapter 10, thank you. And I thought that only happened when you get older. <laughs> Matthew chapter 10, Verse 28. <laughs> Jesus said to them as he was sending them out, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There's a good motivation. <laughs> let him be your fear and let him be your dread. The more that we fear God, the more we're going to want to obey his word because we don't want to get out of step with him. We, we respect him. We honour him. We know that God is not mocked. You can't mock God and not reap destruction. But if you sow according to the spirit, if you learn how to be led by the spirit as a disciple, taught in the word of God, then you will reap everlasting life. Hallelujah. And so we are to hallow the name and to fear him and not fear the threats. So, so a, dis- a life of a disciple is a life learning to hallow the name and fear God. At the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, he said this is the conclusion of the matter. After a whole 12 interesting chapters of that book, <laughs> he just says this is the conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's man's all. That's the purpose of life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Fear God and keep his commandments. So discipleship is a life learning now to fear God and keep his commands, walking in his ways. Who's signing up? Who's already signed up? Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 14. Isaiah 8, 14. This is awesome. If we hallow his name, fear him and let him be our dread, you know what he will be? He will be as a sanctuary. Hallelujah. You'll find your life in him. When you walk, you'll realize I'm in him. I'm in him. He's my, I'm hallowing his name. He's my fear. He's my dread. And when you start, ah, he's my sanctuary. And that word sanctuary, it says, could be translated my holy abode. He's the place where I live that is holy. It's set apart. Hallelujah. I've got a secret place in him. Amen. Isn't that awesome? That he will be as a sanctuary. So true disciples find their sanctuary in God. Hallelujah. So to those who are not caught up in conspiracies and false doctrines, but fear God and do not fear man, Yahweh will be a sanctuary and abode. And look in, look in John chapter 15 and verse 7 and 8. John 15, verse 7 and 8. This is what Jesus said. He said, If you abide in me, in other words, if you make me your, your sanctuary, if you make me your holy abode, and my words abide in you, they live in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. And by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. Hallelujah. So an awesome characteristic of a disciple is one who finds their abode in Christ. Amen. He becomes their holy abode, their sanctuary. Back in Isaiah 8.14, because then it says after that though, so to, to those who submit to that discipleship, he becomes a sanctuary. 
but he becomes a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence to both the houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So this is, even in Isaiah's day, he was saying that he will be as a sanctuary to those who actually let him be their fear and their dread, but to the others, the others who are meant to be the people of God, he will be a stumbling block and a stone, a rock of offence. And who is this ultimately talking about? Yeah, how do you know that? Because it's quoted later on. Hallelujah. And so have a look in um, 1 Peter chapter 2 again. 1 Peter, Peter must have liked Isaiah chapter 8 because he has a few quotes from there. 1 Peter chapter 2, we'll read it from verse 7 to 9. This is what Peter said. He said, Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. Who, 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 who is it who sees him as a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence? Well, what does the word actually say here? The disobedient. Those who are disobedient. In other words, those who have not submitted to be disciples, to be taught by the word of God, who have not heeded the word, who have not decided to remain under the word and be a disciple and taught by the word, to those ones he becomes a a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. Reading on, it says, They stumble being what? Disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you, say but you. So to this is to the obedient, amen? These are to the disciples who found him to be a sanctuary. You are a chosen generation. Say, you are a chosen generation. Say, I am a, ro- a part of a royal priesthood. Hallelujah. You are part of a holy nation. His own special people. This is the group of disciples. Amen. Those who've chosen to be the chosen generation. Amen. So back in Isaiah chapter 8. So the ones who receive him as a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence are those who are disobedient. And it says in verse 15 then, And many among them shall stumble, they shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. So the way of discipleship really is the only way. Because any other way will be a place of stumbling and will be a snare and you'll be taken. That's dangerous. Knowing a bit about Matthew 24 now, you don't want to be taken. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16. Isaiah chapter 8 now verse 16. Now we're into this key part of the key verse about disciples here. Bind up the testimony. Say, bind up the testimony. Seal the law. Say, seal the law. Among my disciples. Hallelujah. So this word testimony really means just that. It means a testimony or a witness. It actually means an attestation. I had to look up what attestation (laughs) means. But as someone who witnesses somebody else's signature on a document or something, you're you're attesting to that. In other words, you're a witness. Amen. So we're to bind up the testimony. What does that mean? So this is something for disciples. They're to bind up the testimony. Sorry? Yeah, to know it well, bind it up. Amen. We're, we're to, it's to be bound up in us. We're to bind up the testimony. It's to be established. It's to be ingrained into us. Bind it up. And what is the testimony? Well, amen, that's a good testimony. The testimony, let's have a look at a few verses. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Knowing that the word testimony also means witness. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You shall Testify of Jesus. So how do we bind up the testimony? One of the major parts is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Disciples need to be filled with the Holy Spirit to testify of Jesus. Amen. 
to be witnesses to Jesus Christ. Bind up the testimony. Look in 1 John chapter 5. Yeah, we'll get there. (laughs) 1 John chapter 5, verse 9 to 12. says this. 1 John 5, verse 9 to 12. says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. So you know that the witness of God is actually the testimony of the Son. God's witness is the Son of God. Amen? He testifies of his Son. And then it says in verse 10, He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. So bind up the testimony. How do we get the witness in ourselves? How do we get the testimony in ourselves? Believe in the Son of God. Hallelujah. Disciples are people who believe not just once to get born again, but who every day are walking in believing, faith, trusting in the Son of God, knowing who He is, having a testimony of that faith every day. What are you doing today? I'm believing in the Son of God. What about you? Hallelujah. I'm a disciple. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. So we're to bind up the testimony, the testimony of the Son of God. We're to give testimony of the Son of God continually as disciples. Hallelujah. That's our job. Verse 11 then says, And this is the testimony. You want to know what the testimony is? That God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Hallelujah. We bind up the te- What's the testimony? That God has given me eternal life and this life is in the son of God. Hallelujah. So disciples are meant to be full of eternal life. Have you got... Yeah, you're allowed to get excited, Paul. Hallelujah. Bind up the testimony, disciples. Have the eternal life. See, Paul said to Timothy, lay hold of eternal life to which you were called. That's like saying, bind up the testimony because the testimony of God is this, that he's given us eternal life and that life is in his Son. (coughs) Verse 12 says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. They're dead, men walking. Hallelujah. So is the testimony bound up in you? Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 and 17. Who knows what that says? Romans 8, verse 16 and 17, talking again about the testimony, the witness. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together with him. So the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So what's the testimony? I'm a child of God. The Spirit bears witness with my spirit. I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. Bind up the testimony. Revelation 19 verse 10. You can just put this verse down. Underneath Revelation 19 verse 10, the final part of that verse says that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So bind up the testimony. Speak by the spirit of prophecy. Because what is the spirit of prophecy? It's the testimony of Jesus. One final one, Revelation 12, 11. How did they overcome him? How was one of the ways that they overcame? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Hallelujah. Disciples learn how to overcome because they've bound up the testimony within them. And so now the word they speak is the word of their testimony. In other words, they're speaking of the reality of the life of Jesus within them that has changed them. It's bound up in them. Hallelujah. And so like in one of the discipleship classes we were having this week, we're to continue to develop the way we share Jesus with people in real terms. Amen? So just to say to somebody, you know, I believe in Jesus because he died on the cross for my sins and now, you know, and now I'm, I'm forgiven. Okay, what does that all mean? Well, it actually means Jesus came into my life and I was in a lot of bad stuff. And you could probably name a few things or whatever. 
But when Jesus came into my life, I realized that he, he could just cleanse me, heal me. He, it just felt like all that stuff was just taken away and I just had a new life. I was free. For the first time in my life, I felt free because of Jesus. He's so beautiful the way he did it. Hallelujah. It's awesome. So the word of our testimony, no one can stand against it if you've got a testimony of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So the other thing he said in verse 16 was, seal the law among my disciples. Hallelujah. Seal the law. Say seal. Mm, It's not talking about the sea creature. (laughs) But it's talking about, again, something being sealed, stamped. It's airtight. Yes, it's sealed. So the law is to be sealed. And what's the law? It's in Hebrew the word Torah. And the word Torah means the instruction, the teaching, the doctrine. Hallelujah. So the teaching of the word of God. See, making disciples is Matthew 28, verse 20. Teaching them to observe everything that Jesus commanded. Amen? Making disciples is teaching all that Jesus commanded. And that teaching is to be sealed among the disciples. In other words, it's to become airtight. It's to become so ingrained within us that we're just speaking the word. Amen? I don't mean parroting exactly phrase for phrase, but it's the word of God that's coming out of you. Amen? The teaching is coming out of you. In, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, you could just put this down. This was, this was after the persecution that arose in Jerusalem and it says that the disciples, they were scattered everywhere except the apostles remained in Jerusalem. And they went everywhere doing what? Preaching the word. So these, these, these disciples who were scattered through persecution didn't set up a refugee camp somewhere and bemoan their situation and look for the UN to help them. They actually went everywhere preaching the word of God. Hallelujah. How could that be? Because the law, the instruction, the teaching was sealed in them. They were well discipled. They were instructed in the word. Hallelujah. Seal the law among my disciples. So being a disciple is being someone who's submitted to the teaching of the word of God and having that sealed within them. Jeremiah 31 verse 33. The new covenant. What was, what's the first promise of the new covenant? God said, I'll put my law, my Torah, in your mind and I will write it on your hearts. Hallelujah. So being a new covenant person is the first way that the law gets sealed in you. Amen. So being a disciple is to have the law sealed, the teaching sealed in you. John 8, 31 and 32. Who knows that one? John 8:31 and 32. To the Jews who believed, he said, If you abide or continue or remain in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Hallelujah. So what's the hallmark of a disciple? Someone who abides, lives, remains, continues in the word of Jesus. Amen. In his word. Amen. And the fruit of actually walking in this way as a disciple will be freedom because of coming to the knowledge of the truth through that word. Hallelujah. Because if you follow the way, you get released into the truth, which then manifests the life. Hallelujah. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So when we follow in the way as a disciple, we come to know the truth which releases us into the freedom of his life. Amen. Isn't that awesome? And and you can just put this down for your own reference, but 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3 to 6, Paul says about the Corinthians that they are living epistles, living letters. Hallelujah. Written by the Spirit of God, not with ink. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh of the heart. So the law was sealed in them, written by the Spirit of God in them. 
Amen? So that they, as they were walking around, they were a living letter of Christ. Hallelujah. So the discipleship life, being a disciple, is becoming a living epistle, a living letter. Amen? So that when someone meets you, they can read the book of you and see the word, see Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Isaiah chapter 8. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 8, back there. Now in verse 17. Hallelujah. So bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. So are you a disciple? Amen. Because then he says in verse 17, he says, And I will wait on Yahweh, who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. So just two, two things about disciples here. They wait on Yahweh and they hope in him, even in the midst of God turning his face away from his people. Because of the people of God in Isaiah's day being disobedient and against God, Isaiah learned as a disciple of Yahweh that he had to wait on Yahweh and put his hope in him. So maybe the churches aren't cutting it, or what we've called churches, and you haven't been experiencing God there. You, haven't been, you know that he's turned his face away. There's no life there. As a disciple, you're to walk with him, wait on him. Hope in him. And that word wait on him, it's really interesting. It actually means to adhere in the Hebrew. The word wait means to adhere, to join. What's a disciple? An adherent. Someone who sticks like glue to the teacher. Hallelujah. So to wait on Yahweh means to adhere, to join with him. And I mean, this is interesting too. It actually comes from a word or it's linked to a word that has the idea of piercing. And so we are to be joined with him in his piercing, in his cross. Amen. True disciples adhere to him even through baptism, then dying with him, being buried and being raised with him, but now living that out. So you join with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hoping in him means to continually have an expectant attitude. Expecting, and it means to bind together by twisting as well. So it's got the idea of joining as well. To put your hope in him means to be bound together with him and expectantly looking for him. Hallelujah. So this is, this is some practical realities of how disciples walk. They wait on him, they hope in him even in the midst of a generation of so-called people of God whom God has hid his face from. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18. Then he goes into this awesome, you know, almost like a jubilant phrase here now. He says, Here am I and the children whom Yahweh has given me. Hallelujah. And, and you know, this, this was prophetically... Speaking of Jesus, because in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 13, it's quoted there about the Messiah, that, he's, that it's of him, here am I and the children whom Yahweh has given me. So true disciples get to know Jesus as their father. He's the one, who, and, and true disciples are the children. Remember when, when, when Jesus' family were outside the door when he was teaching and a, and, a, and a message came into Jesus, your family is looking for you, your mother and your brothers. They want you to come outside and talk to them. And what did he say? Who's my mother and my brothers? He who does the will of God. He who hears and does the will of God. That's my mother, my sister, my brother. Hallelujah. So as disciples, we actually become family. It's not a cold relationship of do this, do that. When you become a disciple, you become one of Jesus' children. Hallelujah. And that may not be a, a big band of people. That may be just like here this morning. Here am I, Jesus says, and the children whom Yahweh has given to me. Hallelujah. Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He loves, Jesus loves to be here in Shiloh with some people who want to be taught and instructed and discipled. 
even more than a big gathering of thousands who are just there to hear the great speaker who's going to speak. Here am I, Jesus says, and the children whom Yahweh has given me. Who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? But those who want to hear the word of God and do it. That's my family. Hallelujah. So he says, Here am I and the children whom Yahweh has given me. We are for signs and wonders in Israel. As a disciple, you're a sign and a wonder. Anyone who truly commits themselves to be a disciple will be a sign and a wonder to most people. Amen? I'm a sign and a wonder, I know, to my family. I know my mother wonders about me, but she still thinks I'm doing an all right job. (laughs) She sees some good fruit, I think, and she's like, yeah, well, doing all right. (laughs) Hallelujah. My sister's just really happy that I'm happy. (laughs) (laughs) We are for signs and wonders. People might look at you like... That's because you're a sign and a wonder. It's not every day that people meet someone who's a disciple of Jesus Christ. Who's actually given themselves to Jesus to follow him, to be goaded and instructed by him. They don't run off to the things that everybody else runs off to. And it's from Yahweh. Of, see, every time you're in the workplace and even someone tries to bring up some you know, filthy conversation and you just back out of it. Sorry, I don't want to get involved in that. That's a sign and a wonder. What are you doing that for? Well, I actually believe in Jesus and I fear him and the way you guys are talking, that's just not good. So I just can't get involved in that. If you want to talk about something better, I can get involved with that. Wow, yeah. You met met this guy before? (laughs) Now you become a sign and a wonder. You become a walking signal of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it says, this is from Yahweh of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Hallelujah. So I won't worry about that. But just to say that in the end of the book of Obadiah, in the end of the big book, (laughs) it's it's only one chapter long, 21 verses long, at the end of that book of Obadiah's prophecy, it says, then deliverers or saviors will come to Mount Zion and the kingdom and they they will judge the mountains of Esau and the kingdom shall be Yahweh's. Hallelujah. A, just there, A. Obadiah. Yep. Verse 21. Yeah, well, not even one. Yeah, just 21. So Obadiah says that that deliverers, in that day, that deliverers and saviors will come to Mount Zion. You see, we are signs and wonders from Yahweh of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Hallelujah. So true disciples will find themselves coming to Mount Zion. Hallelujah. And they will be as deliverers and saviors. Hallelujah. Bringing the rest of God's people, whoever's willing, into that freedom. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) All right, verse 19. It then says, And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? So what is this saying now? Well, yeah, the true disciples are going to be discerning. True disciples are going to know when something is not of God. Amen? True disciples won't be seduced by witchcraft coming against them. True disciples are learning their authority even over demonic things. And the disciple, when the 70 went out in Luke chapter 10, they came back in verse 17 saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. So Luke 10, verse 17 to 19. You can just put here, True disciples, because of being discipled, having the the testimony bound up in them and and the law sealed in them, by hallowing him and by fearing him, having him as their sanctuary. Because of that, they can discern between good and evil, amen? They can discern when there's witchcraft. Witchcraft doesn't just have to be blatant, you know, sacrificing a goat to a demon. Witchcraft can be somebody 
preaching the word of God in a perverted way that's twisting it. And that's bringing a witchcraft on you because it's, I don't know if you've ever felt it, but I even now feel when someone's speaking off, my head even turns a bit. I just feel it in my, just, it's a twisting. And it's witchcraft because it's deceiving God's people. When, when, when Paul was writing to the Galatians, he was writing about Jews who were supposedly believers in Jesus the Messiah coming and teaching law and telling them to be circumcised and telling them this and that. And you know what Paul called it? Witchcraft. He said, who has bewitched you? That you've turned from the gospel by which, which called you. And so by, by being discipled properly, you begin to discern between good and evil. Amen? Because in verse 20, this is the catch cry of disciples. Hallelujah. True disciples, whenever anything is coming that is not, that you know you're discerning that is not of God, to the law and to the testimony. Hallelujah. Why don't you say that with me? Say, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, there is no light in them. Hallelujah. That's the catch cry of true disciples. Hallelujah. To the law and to the testimony. And so you can just put in there Hebrews 5, 13 and 14 because true disciples, Hebrews 5, oh, you did. Good on you. <laughs> Hallelujah. I didn't even mention it. And you're on it. That's a good disciple. So verse, th- yeah, verse 12 to 14, the whole bit, that if we remain on milk then we won't be able to discern good and evil. We'll be children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. But if we are disciples now who go through the milk and now are wanting to grow on the solid food, it says that we begin to grow up then on the word of righteousness and we have our senses exercised then to discern between good and evil. Amen? And then we can begin to teach others because that's the goal of discipleship is that once you've been taught and instructed and discipled, you can teach Others. Hallelujah. So have you got some good things about being a disciple? Amen? That we do not walk in the way of this people, but we walk in the way. We become people of the way. And so God is wanting us more and more to become a fellowship of disciples. And we are that, but but, you know, we want to realise that's what we really are. Amen? We want to have that as our identity that we are people of the way, we are people walking in a new lifestyle together, fleshing out the gospel as disciples, learning how to be taught and instructed by the word together. Hallelujah. Learning to not get caught in conspiracies and doctrines that are false and and just leading people astray, but we let God be our, our dread and we hallow him. Amen. And so then we bind up the testimony. So we we continue in the testimony of Jesus Christ as disciples. We have the law, the teaching, the instruction sealed in us. So we're giving ourselves to the teaching of the word, abiding in the word, knowing the truth. The truth makes us free so that we continue to walk into more and more freedom as disciples. Hallelujah. And then we wait on him. We adhere to him. And then we also hope in him. We are bound together with him, expectantly looking for him, finding ourselves to be children of Jesus Christ in the family as disciples, being signs and wonders and now also being discerning between good and evil, knowing right from wrong, knowing what is of the devil and what is of God. Hallelujah. So brethren, this is all about being a disciple. Amen.